Thank you all for joining me today. And before I introduce myself or even dive into today's topic, I would like to share a personal moment. Uh, here is my 15-month-old son. He's captivated by the garbage truck outside of our home. He's like many other toddlers. Um, he's fascinated with those massive trucks that they drive through the neighborhood, collect the trash, and leave. So, if you noticed here, I kept him uh, on a far distance from the truck. It's not just for his own safety, but I don't want him to inhale all those bad pollutants into his lungs. Unfortunately, those, these massive trucks drive to where we live, where our kids grow and develop. So let's reflect for a moment. Is that really the best that we can do for our generation, for our future generation? I am sure that the answer is a resounding no for all of you, right? So this concern is what drove my capstone project for my master's in sustainability. I had the privilege of working with a wonderful city that puts the residents' well-being first. That's the city of Medicine Hat, CMH in Alberta, Canada. I am Raida Adum, and I crafted the sustainability action plan for the city to transition their heavy-duty fleets to a greener uh, alternative. And what I did is for the project today, I will just walk you through some of the opportunities and risks, the challenge that I faced with this project, the recommendation that I developed for the city, and the implementation plan for the recommendations. CMH is a mid-sized city known to be the sunniest city in Canada, although many other Canadian cities claim that title too. The city is rich in natural resources, especially natural gas, but recently they're diversifying away from gas and they're aiming to up, uh, upgrade their fleet to a greener one and reducing their carbon emissions. And in the next slide, I will explain why is that crucial for Alberta to reduce emissions. To understand the importance of the transition, we need to look at the bigger picture. As we all know, Car uh, carbon emissions is a worldwide problem, but Canada stands out as one of the highest emitting countries per capita per year. Alberta is a leader emitter among Canadian provinces. It's shown here in green. Uh, its emissions are a staggering 58 percent, uh, 58 tons per capita. To put that in perspective, only Wyoming and North Dakota in the United States have higher emission per capita. But the good news are that Alberta is uh, very aware of this issue. They're working so hard to reduce their carbon emissions and they're being a leader in clean energy. So now let's focus on one of the major contributors to, the, to those uh, emissions the transportation sector. I guess many business professionals and entrepreneurs are aware with the eight, uh, 20 to 80 rule, which is when the 20% of the effort drive the 80% of the result. In the context of heavy duty fleet, let me tell you that uh, rule is even more pronounced because heavy-duty fleets are only 3% of all vehicles, but they are responsible for 50% uh, of the emission. That's equivalent to the remaining 97% of, uh, of, of the other uh, light-duty vehicle. So this disparity actually underscores the importance of focusing on heavy-duty fleets in our effort to reduce carbon emission faster. Given the significant impact of the heavy-duty fleet, uh, my client has a specific uh, requirement. First, to build a total cost of ownership for different kinds of vehicles, DCO model, and then to investigate the charging and infrastructure and the fueling cost. And, uh, uh, of course, considering other factors like the... Um, uh, like the uh, training, uh, awareness, and the community engagement. 
transitions are mainly uh, fundamentally about people, right? So to ensure a, a smoother transi a transition, we need to understand the key players involved in the equation. For the city of Medicine Hat, the key players are the city leadership, the fleet department, the residents, the worker, the operator, and drivers of the truck themselves. So I use the uh, stakeholder matrix to analyze uh, each power's group and interest, where they lay in the matrix, how they interact with each other to ensure a successful project. And here's the thing. When we embark on a project on a municipal scale, we might feel uh, scared uh, of the result. But when we analyze the opportunities that the project carry, and be aware already of the risks that might the project carry, we will feel more confident and more empowered to pursue. So some of the opportunities for the city of Medicine Hat is to leverage the federal subsidies to have an impact beyond the CMH fleet, and of course, to enhance the well-being for the residents and wildlife as well. And this one is especially important for CMH because it's gonna attract new talent talent and newcomer. And while some of the risks are the financial costs, the electrical grid capacity, and the uh, market availability for other alternatives to choose from, and of course not rushing to over-invest in infrastructure that they might not use later. And the last one here is the public opinion about this transition. For the financial analysis, I developed a total cost of ownership model that calculates one-time and ongoing uh, operational costs. And what I found while comparing the TCO for electrical hydrogen compressed natural gas and diesel truck, that the BEVs have, the, uh, a, have a higher initial cost due to acquisition prices than diesel and natural gas, but they do have a lower uh, uh, operational cost, and that eventually will accumulate to a lower TCO model through their lifespan. While we can see in orange here, the hydrogen have the highest initial and operational costs. The two graphs over here illustrate the TCO composition over 10 years for the diesel and electrical truck. We can see obviously that the diesel have a big uh, portion that goes to expenses like fuel, repair, and maintenance, while the initial cost is dominate, uh, dominating the electrical truck. The second model is to keep or replace model. This model will help the city to make informed decision when they want to transition from diesel to other alternatives. So, Let's, to make it easier, let's take an example um, of an old uh, eight-year-old diesel garbage truck. So by the end of its lifespan, this truck will have higher expenses uh, and repair and maintenance and fueling, and it will have significant higher carbon emissions. So now the question, what is wiser, wiser for the city of Medicine Hat is to keep that truck pay all those extra expenses and the higher emissions, or just simply replace it with a, uh, a new truck and invest in a BEV. So the model will be there for them to calculate the net present value for the old and new truck. And then we'll calculate the equivalent annual cost, the EAC, and the city here will choose the one with the lower uh, annual cost. And in our example here, it's gonna be the BEV shown in green. While cost is very important, there are some other factors that are equally important too, like pollution and maintenance, range anxiety for the vehicles, the impact of cold weather on the vehicle performance itself. And here the graph on the right sh uh, shows and emphasizes how different kind of uh, fleets require different kind of solutions. BEVs are uh, ideal uh, example for uh, ideal for the municipal use. Why? Because of their short range use and the low payload demand. While if you can notice here, the higher range uh, use, uh, lo long range use and higher payload demand requires another alternatives like hydrogen or uh, uh, compressed natural gas. Back to carbon emissions, BEVs do not 
cause any pollution, uh, pollution in residential areas, even we, when we are accounting their power generation. They emit 63% less carbon than diesel, while hydrogen only emits 15% uh, less than diesel. So based on this thorough research, I developed four sets of recommendation for the city. The first one is to phase in BEV, BEVs and avoid hydrogen for now. I know that seems a bit strange, but bear with me, I will explain why. First, let's take a look why BEVs make great for the city. Because of their short range use, they do not pollute residential areas. The, uh, um, they can be charged during optimal times. And uh, the market, there are more options in the market for the city to choose from. And of course, we don't want to forget the lowest TCO model over their lifespan. While BEVs are great, what about hydrogen? Why did I, did I advise the city to stay away just for now? Because now it's still have the highest TCO cost. Uh, it requires very costly infrastructure and it does not uh, provide significant greenhouse gas emission reduction. And the market for hydrogen is still developing. But definitely hydrogen is, part, is a big part of the future. So they have to be informed and update and add when the technology advanced even more. Now let's discuss some of the charging and infrastructure. It's recommended that the city purchases vehicles uh, with telematics to, uh, because they can optimize their charging times uh, during uh, optimal time and, the, and when the renewable energy supply is high. For overnight charging, the city could only use 50 kilowatts charger because of their lower, lower cost and sufficient use for the city. Of course, for higher capacity chargers, uh, uh, they can be used for trucks that actually need shorter time uh, of charging. Training is another uh, key component uh, for the city. B, most BEVs uh, manufacturers, they provide uh, comprehensive support for designing system, uh, charging system and training employees. The city definitely could benefit from that. And the city should train their employees on high voltage safety. I included in my report so many resources about the training from Canadian universities. And uh, the city could consider also forming a green team for the transition to make it easier. And they could do, uh, uh, they could train one of their employees to become trainer for the others. And in this way, they can lower the cost of training. For the awareness and community engagement, the city could enhance the visibility of the new trucks by, by writing signs on the truck themselves. And um, they could also engage the residents by, uh, uh, for, by creating town hall events that explains the plan and the purpose behind it. But the most important one is that the city could partner and um, uh, uh, communicate with other mid-sized cities to communicate their needs for the manufacturer so the manufacturer actually could listen to their requirements and due to they have more options to choose from in the market. To aid in the decision making for the city, there were the monetary factors that we talked about before, but also there were some of the non-monetary factors like the vehicle range, use, uh, the capacity, uh, the telematics int uh, and integration, integrating new technology. And of course, the city could test different charging optimization system for different vehicle use. And they could do the same with different size batteries. So now, after all those recommendations, there was a, a implementation map to ensure a proper implementation uh, for those recommendations. For each, it was divided to three steps. For each step or phase of this plan, there was a study of the, uh, of the time, value, cost, uh, action, ownership of the step. 
was provided in the report. The first phase is the uh, the testing the testing phase, where the city will will test with only uh, five percent of their fleet to ensure uninterrupted service to the resident. The second stage is the transition, when the city will start to, trans to, to, to transition all their di diesel uh, vehicles to, another, uh, to other options uh, when, they're nearing, uh, when they are nearing their uh, end of their lifespan or maybe earlier, depends on the economic of the decision. And when the transition is completed, uh, there will be a ZEV's optimization. It will be an ongoing task to ensure high efficiency at the lowest cost. So now, just to wrap it up, and in conclusion, I would like to say that this project is not only unique to the city of Medicine Hat. This project or this plan could be implemented to different kinds of cities, size of cities, and, si and different size of fleets. So moving toward more sustainable future, definitely we need more sustainable cities. And to be able to achieve that, we need to put people, health, well-being, and needs first. And no one alone can achieve that. So we need a collaboration between different stakeholders, from academic institutions to um, uh, from academic institutions to uh, policymakers, civil society, and uh, residents of the city. So let's be one powerful team toward more sustainable cities and more sustainable future. And thank you.